Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. Today's guest is Greg Hemmings of Hemmings House. Based in St. John, it's a video production company that has done some fascinating projects. We hope you enjoy the conversation as Greg takes us on a whirlwind tour that's high energy of his perspectives on storytelling, changing New Brunswick's narrative, and running a business in this province. Hope you enjoy the conversation. One of the themes that comes up for New Brunswick is it needs a new narrative. Because, mm -hmm. um, for example, McLean's Magazine does something that uh, last year it was brutal. Yep. It was just, do you remember it? Well, I was involved with that piece. Really? Okay, so in, if you look at that McLean's article that was brutal to New Brunswick, um, the very last interview, so the last sentence was me. They interviewed me for and I was the only guy that had a positive swing on the whole thing. So the guy interviewed me, and I swear the interview went for two hours, or more even. Like, it was a long, robust interview, and I was talking about all the things that are really cool that are happening in, in the province. Acknowledging challenges, of course. You know, we don't want to be blind to that, but um, I just gave him so much great material the, of cool stuff that's going on. And, but now I'm really happy that the editor left my, at least put me in there because I was the only, you know, positive saving grace in the whole article. Uh, and, but there's something else that was interesting about it too, which really made me learn a lot about how this type of sensationalized journalism works is, uh, really the journalist was a really good journalist, great interviewer. Um, and he did his research. The thing is, is he was probably put on an assignment to get a negative story right mm. so i met the photographer as well because he wanted to take some shots of me because i was one of the potential people so yep. we're getting shots all over st john all this beautiful brick and beam and great <laughs> shots you know and i was just so proud you know yeah. and he ended up not using the the editor not the photographer the editor ended up using none of those gorgeous shots of st john well the three or four shots in the story are like some dude walking across the street with sort of a barren city well, that, scape background. that building is still barren and it's run down to the top of king street uh and it's embarrassing but guess what that's one building <laughs> out of an, a, an immense amount of gorgeous yeah. buildings and uh renovated buildings that commercial properties, uh, Historica, uh, Crave Soup with the Revolution folks, uh, uh, Derek and Terry. All these people are doing so many cool things with buildings in St. John, and they show that, that rotting one at the top of King Street. Yeah. Now, just really quickly to finish that story, I met with Jerry Pond, um, I don't know, a, month, oh, a couple months ago or something, and he said, Greg, you should go with a VR camera, which I did, go exactly where that angle was, at the top of King Street, and if it's a VR camera, yep. you can actually look around. Uh, so I did that. I, I haven't released it yet. Maybe maybe I will sometime. But I, I stood at exactly where the McLean's article was. I put a digital imprint. Yep. You, you saw the guy walking across the street, and I told everybody, "Look around. There's a beautiful park here. There's a ton of people in it. Oh look, there's a brand new uh, renovated UNB building right here. There's like there's so much life going on here." But those angles are, they sell advertisements, they sell magazines on sensational things. So anyway, that's what we're working against. That's what we're fighting against. It's cool. And, and here's what McLean sees. And, you know, McLean's picked that piece of the whole dynamic across the, the full range, which, which is an interesting story because New Brunswick's had an uphill battle for a long time with getting national recognition or any, even national balance. You know, whether it's, whether it's uh, by population, I'm wandering into... PEI has its hooks, and everybody thinks PEI and they smile. Whether it's potatoes or Anne or golf or red and green, you know, eh. Nova Scotia's got its version. Oh, let's go down east, listen to some kitchen party music, drink some beers, have some lobster, and go to Peggy's Cove. New Brunswick? It's What's our thing? <laughs> talk, yeah, talk about a wide open opportunity for, yeah. uh, for rather than it's a detriment. No, it's wide open for us. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Well, uh, a couple of things. We are a drive-through province, and that's a problem that we've created, mm. uh, and I can go into that a little bit later on. Uh, we have incredible beaches, yeah. like world-class beaches here. We've got world-class waterfront. Like, I just yesterday I went to St. Martin's, and the, the Fun Day Parkway, yep. that's our version of the Cabot Trail. Yep. And as soon as that last segment gets connected to Fun Day Park, like, the stuff that we have yep. goes head to head with all these other regions that people just drive through us now um is it more than just rebranding 
Yeah, it's an attitude shift, and it's our fault. It's nobody else's fault but ours, because we are the ones that say, um, like, for example, your wife moved here from Toronto, right? Toronto? Yeah. When she came, I guarantee you, someone said, why would you move here? I'm <laughs> sure at least 10 people asked her that. Does anybody really live in New Brunswick? Right, So, but we are the one perpetuating and creating the stereotype uh, by being negative about our assets. And all you have to do, in my opinion, is ask somebody you know that has a boat, canoe, sailboat, motor, whatever, and get out on our rivers and look at your city from that perspective. Yeah. And uh, it's a strange little request, but it is you see this province in the water in such an epic way, and that's one. That's one of many things to be crazy proud about. You know. Here's a fun little riff on that theme of you know get on the water and see it from the other perspective. Um, in Funday National Park two years ago, walking on a trail meet some people coming the other direction, um, mid-60s or so, uh, thick accents, German accents as it turned out. How much further to the waterfall? They wanted to know if they could make it. Yeah, you can make it. Where are you from? Well, from New York. So curiosity peaked. What brings you here from New York, right? Yeah. Oh, we like it here because no one knows it's here. So. The next day, we're at the little <laughs> coffee shop in Alma. That's awesome. I can't remember its name right now. Young couple, mid-30s, have all the kit from Mountain Equipment Co-op and all that stuff from Vermont. Ask the same question. What, what brought you here? Oh, we love it here because no one knows it's here yet. Yeah. So here's the paradox. How do we help New Brunswick have, you know, viable tourism business or different cultural identity across the country? And at the same time, it's nice that you live somewhere else you know, or that you really don't know we're here. Well, there's a, a clever way to approach us being a bit of a mystery and a bit of a secret. Uh, that this, this is a storytelling marketing discussion because um, in a way we don't want crowded beaches. I surf in the Bay of Fundy and <laughs> I am not one of those people who... That's are, not an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. We actually have decent waves in the Bay of Fundy. But until five, six years ago when we started surfing it, nobody surfed here because you wouldn't think of it. Yeah. Now we've got probably 20, 25 regular surfers in the Bay of Fundy. People are coming from Moncton, Fredericton, all over to come surf in our waves. For me, it's more the merry. Like, let's get as many people enjoying the bay. But in other places, your waves can get so filled and jam-packed, like Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia, would be a very popular surf spot. So there's a certain point where you don't want too many people to know yep. about your, your gem. Yep. But at the same time, you do want people to know that, hey, listen, we want high-quality uh, experiencers of life to come check this place out. And they're the ones that are going to have to find this place. But if we're not going to do it with big billboards and, and magazines, we have to do it kind of like a citizen-led thing. Like, hey, sh hush, hush, don't tell too many people, but we've got this cottage up on the Miramichi River and love to, love to rent it out to you. Or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but it's a... Uh, yeah. But we need pride first. Yeah. And the, the other thing about the pride thing that I, I've noticed is... Although we're all very negative, I, I'm not putting myself in that bucket, but I say we collectively as New Brunswickers, we're, maybe we're, we're humble to a, to a defeatist point. I don't know what it is, but I think at, in the core we are all very proud to be New Brunswickers because once you get past the, oh, you know, St. John industrial town and all the stuff, you can get people to show you the coolest restaurants. You'll get them to show you the coolest little trails. What are, everybody's got their pride moments about yep. where they're from you know and i think we can capitalize on it if we put peer pressure on yeah. people <laughs> yeah um as part of our provincial storytelling and that's your profession and through different mediums you know and focuses so if if just put riff a bit so if, if you could do the provincial marketing strategy for tourism you know because we've all done that over a couple of beer or some tea it's like why aren't there signs on that trans canada to let people know when you take the right towards sussex there's all this neat stuff down there, and there's no signage to let you know, really. <laughs> um, some people have GPSs. Some people will be plugged into the Internet version of that, but most people are just going to drive right by. So you must have played with, what if we did this kind of ad campaign? Or, do you have any off well, the top of your head that would be kind of fun? Yeah, it, it, it's funny and interesting that Hemings House, my company, we really haven't done any tourism work, and we're a film story company here in the province, and we are so passionate about telling stories of this place um anyway maybe it's something we should talk to the province about sometime but i've always thought it would be funny to do kind of what i just talked about a big billboard thing that says 
trying to get to, to PEI, keep going. Uh, you know, we don't have gorgeous beaches here. We don't, and it's just kind of like a wink, wink, yeah. you know, yeah. or to say, yeah, if you want to spend your money in Nova Scotia, go for it. Yeah. No problem. Because we, it, 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 making that mystique of, we love our secrets so much that we we're happy that you keep driving through, yeah. which is totally not true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, state of Minnesota back in the 90s did a similar ad around fishing. Two old boys out in the middle of some lake early morning, pristine, beautiful, pulling in fish. Yeah. Hear a rumble in the distance, which is a vehicle coming over a bridge. Um, you can see some city boys with their canoe and all their stuff and their Jeep Cherokee or whatever, and they pull off on the side, pull a map out. Meanwhile, the old boys bring in all their good kit and they put out a line with a bobber. And then they hang back like they're not doing anything. And the guys in the truck are like, Hey, any good fishing around here? Because they no, you need to oh. get back on the interstate and go like over go to, to the North, state. North Dakota. Go over there. I love that approach. It's and it's funny. And the thing is, it's actually not tricking anybody because it's just clever. Like the person driving by would totally get what you're doing, but it's it's funny. It's not really a sustainable plan. What I think a sustainable marketing strategy is uh, something that I've been playing around with for the last eight years now is telling like um, global stories from here so lo uh, stories that have a massive local impact but to a global audience um, and doing it in a way that cr creates little miniature legends all over the place and what i'm trying to say here is uh, sistema new brunswick is a perfect example of this where it's a world-class music program for kids here in new brunswick mm -hmm. world-class and We've been sharing the story of Sistema for a very long time, and the world is coming here. South Korea comes here on a regular basis with missions from their education ministry to learn what we're doing in New Brunswick. We've got people from all of the states in Canada coming to Moncton to look at the centers and going to some of our First Nations where, where, uh, where Sistema is, is operating. We are, we are a world-class program here, but without storytelling, out to a global audience, mm -hmm. um, nobody else is going to know what's going on. So people in the music world, the elite of music education, they know where New Brunswick is, yeah. for sure. So yeah. how do we take different, and we've, we've played around with coding as well, and technology and education with Brilliant Labs, with a film called Code Kids that we did. So how do we look at <clears throat> what some of our world-class assets are around New Brunswick that we're doing anyway? We don't have to invent them they're already here yep. people are doing some really cool things and how do we make them legendary in their circles so really it becomes an attraction of this is the place where they do this the best in the world so it's, n it's less about going to the beach but the beach comes after because when these people come <laughs> and check out yeah. how cool this place is then naturally all those other tourism assets come out and i think about seattle in the 1990s where the grunge music scene was just came out of nowhere. Seattle wasn't really known as a music scene before Nirvana and Pearl Jam and yeah. Soundgarden and Screaming Trees. Yeah. And they created uh, this legendary status of Seattle as a music hub, uh, as the, the center point of grunge music and alternative music. I love what they did there. It, it's not that they planned it, it happened. Yeah. We can accelerate things like that in New Brunswick. And the more we do that, the more we share with each other, Hey, look what uh, look what Jenny's doing over here in her world. She's a world class whatever, and he's a world class this. How do we share those stories? And it starts with us sharing them with our with ourselves within New Brunswick. It also sounds too like you're tapping into authentic voice. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a branding strategy. It's not a marketing campaign. It's just here's who we are and how we do what we do. That's right, and that's a storytelling uh, philosophy and. We are great storytellers. We are maritimers. We are some of the best storytellers on earth, right? And uh, <clears throat> if we can't afford a big snazzy marketing campaign, yeah. who cares? Yeah. Why don't we shift those dollars into, let's, I don't know what the tourism budget is, no idea, yeah. but let's, let's pretend it was a million dollars. Let's just pretend. Yeah. Can you imagine if that million dollars was there to do one thing, to promote best case uh, studies that, of, of cool things going on in this province? On social media simple as that and with with small little things little, little videos and campaigns but little tiny micro inputs have nothing to do with tourism at all but everything to do with the innovation that's happening in this place the energy the entrepreneurship the art all of these the, the multiple themes from um, um, 
affordable housing strategies, oh. economy shifts that are possible, uh, biofuels and uh, bioeconomy to, to forestry practice. Like we could pick 15 or 20 different themes and just let that spread out. Well, you had Amanda Hashi on uh, talking about new labs yeah. and new labs is a world-class experience what's happening here. Like who does that? Who experiments with all these things? And yeah. like, that's the beginning of a model that people are gonna copy. That's awesome. Yeah. The, um, the impact of storytelling, um, where does it come from for you? I think for me as a child, I've, uh, I was always the documenter. So I had a band when I was a kid and I was the one that kept all our band posters and videos and photos. Um, <clears throat> we had a tree house. I, uh, I was the one that would, you know, make, maintain it and make sure, I don't know, there's always this, this sense of maintaining some sort of legacy yeah. and like in high school I was in the yearbook um all this the stuff especially in the music industry because i'm a musician as well and i i re recorded documented i filmed over 2,000 hours of live music over the first few years of my business um can i interrupt a sec yeah. what would you play the grunge stuff you mentioned from um yeah like in <clears throat> in high school i was in a band that was kind of that ilk but with a with a real strong influence of like 70s blues rock as well uh, now I still play in a band called Fox Farm, and we're a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a Radiohead, Wilco type of thing. It's kind of hard to explain, but uh, still having a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> but I think the storytelling element just came out of my desire to retain something, not like a hoarder. Like I don't like keeping stuff, but yep. how do we keep the story alive? And in this digital places you know on the internet Amazing. we can we don't have to keep a whole bunch of photo albums around anymore but we can keep the stories alive and so did I, your 2000 hours turn into something well i started my company as really i'd say 80 percent of our paid work was filming for the cmas for harvest jazz and blues for we did all those festivals evolve festival and uh, we we're very tight uh partners with alliant uh, back then it was alliant.net with Chubba Demokas, so he, um, back then, before Bell had their community channels and stuff, they had a pretty robust uh, online content portal for Atlantic Canadian content, and they were always the sponsors for the CMAs and, you know, the Nova Scotia Jazz Fest, and we were the partner to film everything, so we just... You were busy. Busy, just filming so much stuff, and I was, I was living in my, in my element. Yeah. <laughs> How about expanding st storytelling now? Do you think that's uh, the path to go to make the changes we need? Well, it's a, it's a foundational path. It's not, I wouldn't be bald, bold. I would be bald. I'm going bald. <laughs> I'd be bold. I wouldn't be bold enough to say storytelling is the answer. But as a foundation in everything we do, if we can think, because we're all storytellers, whether we think it or not, yeah. if we all approach everything that we do in the form of positive, what I call impact storytelling, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it is contagious and what happens is when you hear so much negative stories on the media and so much negative stories on social media and so much trolling and it's just negative, negative, negative every, everywhere. When you choose to spin something, when I say spin, I don't mean like deceive, yeah, but yeah. pick the just positive pick side, acknowledge the challenge, yeah. but, but really promote the positive side. It's just something I've chosen to do, and a lot of criti critics that say that's that's not a good way to go. But sorry, this is the way I do it. Yep. Um, whether it's let, let, let's pick a topic like healthcare in New Brunswick, it's not in a great spot, right? We know that. We get it. Nobody's well, hiding the fact. Well, that's the public narrative. But I've had several guests on, John McGarry being one of them. And when you hear it from their perspective, it's phenomenal some of the stuff we're doing, especially yeah. for a population base. Well, the, and, so and that's, where I, that's where I was getting to is the, like we hear so much complaint and criticism about the healthcare system. And I just got back from two weeks in the Arctic where it was just so awful to see the lack of basic medical access that the Inuit people have up in these communities. Yeah. It's appalling, really, because you know the Inuit are Canadians. <laughs> Whether they chose to be or not, they are Canadians. And by the way, they're taxpaying Canadians, if that matters to anybody, which is ridiculous. Yeah. But that being said, you would think if we've made arrangements and deals to make sure that they're Canadian and they're taxpaying Canadians, that they'd at least have access to developed world healthcare. They don't. Uh, they're trying. They're, the internet is a, the lack of internet is a massive problem. So I recently wrote a blog 
just a couple of weeks ago about saying how blessed we are in New Brunswick with our health care, despite all of the challenges, but like we are quite entitled uh, and we don't know that until we go to a developing region and then record. So my side is let's let's promote the positive as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, and the role of narrative and all of that. Um, here's a, a lovely little paradox because technology in some senses will uh, bring us closer together. And at the same time, it might um, put us in our little cubicles, you know, or our little uh, phone boxes. Um, so this popped up today on Facebook for me. I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll throw it at Greg and, and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. So it's a George Orwell quote. Um, we'll throw it up on the screen. It says that people will not revolt. They will not look up from their screens long enough to notice what's happening from George Orwell's 1984. Incredible. So, I'm, so relevant. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is a, a lovely conundrum in that on one hand, you know, we can sit in any restaurant, bar, or any public place and see everyone on their phone instead of having conversation. And yet at the same time, there's such a hyper awareness of conversation, but through that platform mm -hmm. or through those mediums. And, and it is more connected. So it's almost like what's missing is the heart of it. There's the mechanics of it, but where's the heart of it? And that could become a foundational piece, like you just said, for shifting a whole provincial narrative. Yeah, well, I think that uh, what's going on in this meme uh, is really interesting because we are so hyper-connected in a good way that we can share stories way quicker and way more impactful than ever before. And having conversations with people from around the world or from different communities on social is becoming critically important on not only on a business level, but on a personal level. This is how people are socially communicating. The, the challenge I see with that is, and I think it's going to adjust, it's starting to adjust now, is we're losing that face-to-face, -face, the art of a human interaction and communication, but I, I'm not afraid. It's coming back. Like, there's going to be a balancing where, like for, for example, when I go to a conference, as an example, I go to a lot of these things, I see everybody doing this, and I just, I can't multitask, so I don't do that. I'm there to meet people and talk to humans, and, and then I'll take a card, that old school thing called a business card, and then I'll follow up, and then I'll engage socially on social media on the net from that point forward but gen x is in an interesting place i think baby boomers are an interesting place too because baby boomers are now pretty much owning facebook which is interesting like my mom's generation for example and, and uh, they love facebook <clears throat> but they've got so many years behind them of that in a human interaction of community form of communication that it's almost like this new form is it's just a nice addition you know the especially when when mobility becomes less in yes. in that in the uh, in the aging demographic but when we have young people learning that this digital way is the only way to communicate there's soft skills that are very important that we're losing but i'm not afraid because i'm already seeing people kind of going back to the analog and you finding that balance you know somewhere in on that same theme with younger people um one of the pleasures of the show is the full range of guests that we get to have on, and, and the perspectives are always fascinating. This will sound like a leap, but it's really not. There's something about gaming, D&D, &D, um, some of the card games and stuff, where they're learning some of those soft social skills that you could almost argue that, that some of the boomers don't have because there's so many cooperative games mm. out there. So they're kind of... The game world almost invites them into a social interaction. I'm thinking of a specific uh, imagination, play-based. Um, you don't know the outcome compared to some of the violent uh, video game. Right, and, right, right. right. The, the other ones where you sit around a table, it'll take three hours to create a character, take 10 hours to play the game. You know, yeah. That's extended periods of play where they're learning all kinds of cooperative relationships. Well, it's interesting because I, I was never a gamer, uh, but I've... I've always been in the social groups of gamers, yeah. and uh, I've always had a respect for for the gamer culture, whether that's analog, uh, like the old Dungeons and Dragons style, uh, or um, what was the uh, what was that amazing war game? Um, oh my gosh, what an embarrassing Warcraft? thing I forgot. No, no, it was. Uh, oh man, Risk. Risk. Going Thank back you. To a board game? Thank you. Yeah. Risk. Whether it was that form or, yeah. or you know, multiplayer digital, you know, uh, gaming in that re regard, I think it's as a, as a storytelling platform, it's amazing, and because of those social connections that happen, mm. 
I don't think we should be afraid of these things. I think it's a, it's a really cool way that we are going to be able to make the world a better place. But we can't do it at the cost of human relationship, like physical, in my opinion. Yeah. I might be that old guy now saying that. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of power in humans getting together and knowing how to communicate without having their eyes down like this. Yeah. You know, Like some kids don't know physically how to communicate eye to eye. Yeah. And that's just a teaching thing. It's a role modeling thing that... I think can be adjusted and is being adjusted. Get comfortable a bit. Um, back to the provincial stuff and, uh, oh, don't lose it. It was about the role of narrative in the province being positive and do you see a direction we, we could be going in, in the short term? Um, I'm thinking a mix of politics and economics, maybe some education, because um, all those storylines carry rough edges okay. rather than um, we're doing these good things. Oh, I know what it was, scale. Uh, we're so small. Um, what's your take on the fact we're 750, 760,000 well, people? Well, and... we all know each other, yeah. which is awesome. Like, it's not, we're, we are one person away from knowing every single person in this province. Yeah. All of us are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a sweeping generalization, but yeah. it's but, pretty much true. But it's, it's true. Like, yeah. uh, you watch that behavior around, you know, if you travel a little bit, oh, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so even how we've connected, for yeah, instance, it, totally. it took one step. And it's no surprise. So I think in that regard, if you look at us as a one community in New Brunswick, that's really powerful. Um, and this province, you know, we've got world-class players in the resource development sector, world-class players in the, in the uh, you know, st startup and digital uh, space. We've got world-class storytellers and businesses and like think about the legacy family companies, Ganong, Irving, McCain, like there's Olin's with Musa. Like there's so much going on in this province that it is a microcosm of the greater economy that is here. And I'm constantly talking with other people who have these conversations about how do we look at New Brunswick as a canvas of experimentation? Like if we are a microcosm of a bigger community, um, how can we experiment here? How do we... How do we accelerate uh, poverty alleviation, um, you know, experiments? Uh, if if that's even, I guess you're not accelerating experiments, but like how how do we Strategy. how do we really make some impact here in small little ways yep. that could be scaled out? Yep. Uh, to we might be able to figure something out in the north side of Fredericton with uh, poverty alleviation that could be modeled out in Toronto and Vancouver and Cincinnati. Yep. Who knows? Yep. But that's a storytelling thing. This is where I'm going back to that. These case studies about people, little movements that are happening all over the place. How do we share their stories to inspire others and vice versa so we can be inspired by those who we connect to that way as well, you know? So yeah, that's a big roundabout uh, answer to your question. <laughs> no, it's good. On that theme then is the, the notion of where does social change come from? So for you, does it come from storytelling? Does, does just telling a good story, is it, does it become entertainment or does it become consciousness aware, awareness raising or does it become a, a bonding experience? Well, story in my mind or my definition is not, it's not a tale. Uh, telling tales is a story. It's a form of storytelling. Uh, fables are, are stories. You know, um, movies are really entertaining stories. A lot of documentaries are educational stories. For me, story is really any way that you communicate what you're all about, what you're doing, who you are, what you believe in. And if we start from the individual person, and then that can grow to community. What's our community story? What's our provincial story? You know, like, but it starts with the person. And um, I really feel that I, I've got this image in my head of like a, a digital wireframe that follows us all around. Uh, and that's our story. So part of my story is a drummer in a band and my long history of making music. So I, I picture this digital world in proportion um, that like shows all my story life of, in the music. Then I've, I've got a whole story in entrepreneurship in New Brunswick. And that's another part that follows me around, right? And it follows you around through digital social media, traditional media, this is on the public record, right? This is storytelling and legacy uh, in the making. And then you've got me, my story as a family, as a husband and as a dad, and as a friend, as a surfer. I've got all these little mini stories that make Greg Hemmings who he is. And 
we can choose how those stories are presented to the outside world. And they can be stories of trauma and stories of great struggle. Um, it is our choice, and that's a hard thing to do, but it is our choice to spin those stories any way we want. We can, we, we can allow other people to shape the story. Like, let's, let's just say the Telegraph Journal, for example, does a piece on the premiere. Well, that might not be Brian Gallant's real story. That's a journalist's perspective from a, a newspaper version. And that imprints on people's story as well. But I think we actually have the power to tell our own story and share our own story and own our own story. And I think if we could inspire people to learn how to do that more, I think that would be a great place for us to start, especially if we're choosing to tell the positive sides or the impact. Hmm. I don't want to be seen as this positive guy that's just fluffy. What's the story, whether it's negative or positive, that's going to make the most positive impact in making our yeah. province move forward? Yeah. For you, integrated into the storytelling is, and you talked about impactful and positively so, is that, do you have any examples or instances where, where um, it created that concrete social change? Because it's as if we're on the cusp of a new way of doing things. So some of it is we have to let go of the old way which leaves us in a quandary, okay, now what? Where do we go? For some people, that's really exciting because now we get to play again and get to create again. For other people, it's scary as all get out because this is the way we've always done it. Mm. This is the way we've always approached poverty. This is the way we've always approached politics. This is the way we always approach um, how we know our own province. But all that shifting, we, we can't say it's not shifting anymore. You can't m miss it the yeah. past five years. So... Does storytelling emerge as one of those, uh, you called it foundational piece, as, as where the real concrete social change is finally going to start to surface? Mm -hmm. it, it totally is, because when I think about uh, how do we get people on board, the last thing I ever want to do is say, the old way is wrong, the new way is right. Because then nobody's going to, only 50% of the people are going to be on board with you. So instead of, just, instead of even being in that argument at all, Finding stories and choosing to tell stories that are proving the new model and really supporting that and those people um, is the way to go. So let, let's use Sean Dunbar at Picaroons as an example. Well, Sean's not unlike a lot of other entrepreneurs in this province or not unlike a lot of other microbrewers around the country. Um, but he was the first in my mind. Now, there might maybe one of the first. Um, people who jumped out of the status quo of beer making in this province uh, and started to bring that craft, the art, the artisan beer into this province many years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many years ago, maybe 18 years ago. And the interesting thing about what Sean created was he had a new story because he wasn't big corporate. He loved beer and he loves the arts, right? So he just started to play around that space and like, I'm going to make good beer and I'm going to support the arts. I'm going to support live music or do my thing. And these other people who, st who started to jump onto that, they're like, oh my gosh, whether they like the beer or not, they're like, look what they're doing. Um, I'm going to start talking with pride about, have you heard about what this brewer is doing? This, this guy, like he's, he's competing against some real big players in space and big respected players in the space. And he's carving it a notch. We're very proud of this. This is why I'm proud of Fredericton, because we have this cool microbrewery in town. Yeah. Once people start picking and choosing those, those impact makers in, in, in the province, and there's a lot of them, yeah. Uh, yeah. little tiny impact makers, and there's, they're, they're all around you. In fact, I would suggest all of us are them. We have a responsibility to lift those people up. And the people who are stuck in that old way, they're going to see enough people lifting up the new economy thinkers. And I'm like, okay, pretty soon, if I don't jump on, I'm gonna miss this boat, right? So we've got the early adopters, you've got the yeah. early majority, late majority, and then the status quo. And the people who are left behind are left behind. Look at Sears. Sears is left behind because they did not innovate and they did not stay relevant. Yeah. And uh, so storytelling and social change in this province is critical, but in the fact that we need to, I'm not saying promote, but support the stories of the champions of this place that are really doing good work. Um, change direction a little bit. Let's talk about St. John. You're born and raised yep. there. 
Um, city's gone through a lot the past 40, 50 years or so. Yeah. Um, you have thoughts about where the city can keep going? Because so much of it's positive. It's so many good things have happened. Mm -hmm. The media still want to harp about poverty rates because that story yeah. cycles every spring, every fall. Yeah, and that's okay because guess what? <laughs> we are becoming world class mm -hmm. in addressing poverty. Mm -hmm. World class because we have such horrible rates of poverty. Mm -hmm. That's a canvas of opportunity now. Yeah. And the cool thing is we're not leaving it as a blank canvas anymore. Yeah. There's so many amazing initiatives and Living SJ is a, is a group, that, umbrella group that kind of pulls all these people together, all these organizations who are addressing it together. And Be Cappy, there's like world-class organizations and things that are happening in St. John to address it. So the media can harp on that all they want. In a way, it's a compliment um, because it's getting better. It really is. And uh, rates are improving because finally people are like, we've had enough. The business community are saying, we've had enough too, we're gonna address this. And it's okay to continue living in struggle and challenge as long as we're doing something about it. Um, and the media's not saying that, they're, they're saying horrible poverty rates, but they're not saying horrible poverty rates, look at these radicals who are putting their neck out to address it and look at all the innovation that's happening. Yeah. So I call my city, well, first of all, I like calling it Surf City, because I like surfing there. Uh, <laughs> Um, the other thing is, um, on the nature side, I just love the Bay of Finding St. John and Kevin Gases River. Yeah. I just got my sailboat in two days ago. I still have, like, these are working man's hands. <laughs> I've got blue paint. Uh, anyway, um, so the nature side of my city, I love. Yeah. We recently did a documentary on CBC called City on Fire. And it was, and it's on CBC online. You can find it. Just Google it. And, uh. It is a great representation of a lot of these little St. John changemakers that love their city. And how that relates to Fredericton and Moncton and Miramichi and uh, Edmonston is there's champions in all of those communities yeah. that love their city and they're doing cool things. And that's what the media should be p focusing on or at least balancing on a little bit. Are I we, love her town. Or we will. Yeah. You know, we'll, well, we'll just go do it. <laughs> exactly. And I am so impressed, like I said earlier about the bringing back these old heritage buildings that um, so many people are doing in the city. The, uh, the uptown core of St. John is magical. And we mentioned Picaroons. The Picaroons General Store is a community meeting place, a center point. It's changed the spirit of the whole place. Now we've got all these cool little pubs and restaurants and, and arts things. It's amazing to see what a couple change makers like Picaroons, like Acre Architects, uh, and others who decide, let's, uh, let's get together and build something. Then you get Keith from Historica saying, hey, there's energy here. I'm going to start renovating these places so young people will start living uptown again because now there's stuff to do. Yeah. You know, and this, this, this uh, regeneration is happening and it's, the energy is great. Yep, lovely stuff. And in that context, you're running a business and mm -hmm. you've been running it for a while now. Yeah. So you want to speak a bit to being, um, you know, a business person or when you go through the website, which we'll put on YouTube and stuff. Right. Um, the, uh, the number of people that work now in the shop, you know. Yeah, well, it fluctuates. For, for many years, we had a, a full-time team of 14. Um, and in a way, that was a little bit of old economy uh, structure. Um, as most of my employees are millennials, and I'm very millennial-minded, uh, we have recently shifted to a really cool system where um, there's much fewer full-timers. There's five of us as full-timers, and our freelance network is much larger. So the fo there's some folks that chose to go freelance that were full-time, but now they can choose yes or no. Yeah. They can work their own hours. They can uh, get paid more, in fact, on their own decision, right? Um, so we've been shifting with the times. Uh, and you know we've been around for 10 years now november will be 10 years Great. and previous to that i i had another similar company for four years mm. um so i've been doing this for about, as an entrepreneur for about 14 years and previous to this i worked in the film industry uh, and worked all over the place but uh yeah building a company in st john and let's say in new brunswick not easy mm. uh especially when my market is not necessarily in St. John or New Brunswick. Yeah. We've built a good little business and a good base here, but we're also doing a lot of work in the U.S. in the in the world of sustainability and triple bottom line and B Corps. Like, like we uh, we just signed a really cool deal with a Vermont-based uh, cheese company that all of us have eaten cheese from. <laughs> you know, like yeah. we're doing really cool things with companies south of the border uh, as well. So we're doing it all from St. John because we love it. 
everybody who works with us, uh, I feel shares that love for our town and that's why we, we built it here. It's just wonderful, fascinating stuff because one of the narratives that needs to shift and you become an example of it, like Amanda and several others now that have been on the show, is that they chose to stay here because they see huge opportunity here instead of what mainstream media will say that all the younger people leave in order to find their careers. Um, there is something to the fact you got to leave sometimes because you need the adventure yeah. and all that stuff. Totally. And one guest offered back, yeah, but we want them to come back, you know. Try encourage them to leave. Yeah. Go. Go and then come back. And with... share. Bring bring back some some yeah. info. Yeah. Um, can you tell us um, a struggle and then a success of running the company? Um, funding is always a beast. Mm -hmm. um, you're managing to survive doing. Um, um, media work where there's been lots who've come before you who've tried to do media work and, and the market size is so small or even the awareness of, of that kind of work yeah. is so small yeah. so it's something that uh, there was the you know a pretty good obstacle that you um, doesn't matter if you've overcome it or not but it's just there so it creates some awareness to it and then you know where the breakthrough occurred or something pretty exciting that was yeah I've got a few but um, one challenge is I started as a TV production company, and we still do TV shows uh, and documentaries for television. But that industry um, that I love and that I grew up in, that I went to film school for, it is a dinosaur. And the funding model is such that we rely on tax credits. We rely on CMF money, and we rely on the broadcaster to be the one that opens up that other money. So that model means and there's less and less owners of broadcasters now. So Chorus Entertainment, for example, they own yeah. W Network, Oprah Network. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, it's a, it so we it. only have a few customers, and you've got all these TV producers across the country trying to get the same money, and so it's hyper competitive. And then in New Brunswick, we've got a you know um, a real challenge in supporting the ROI. Um, and the ROI, by the way, is huge. We had David Campbell do a big impact study um, of the investment from the province into these TV shows in the form of tax credit, for example. Um, it's very tough to defend it because it's not necessarily one dollar back, one dollar in, two dollars back. Yep. In fact, some of the impact studies are showing it's about seven dollars back, yep. but this is in secondary impacts, right? It's not necessarily in selling it. So for, for me, my example is my shop. I've got all these young people who are buying houses because they can work in the industry at my company. I'm using that as, a, as an example. Yeah. There's a, a definite impact, but because it's not a first generation impact that is really solid argument, New Brunswick has had a very floppy uh, and weak system for funding television, which makes it nerve wracking for producers to rely on it. So they, most of them have left. So that's a big challenge big challenge and I chose not to leave I am one of the only English language television producers here that's a that's a full-on company you know um, but we found innovative ways to get around it and we use that system as frosting on the cake when we have a TV show we'll apply for it we're funding our documentaries through innovative ways and our TV series our, and our web videos through partnering with brands and foundations impact investors and instead of saying, hey, we're going to sell a bunch of advertisements for you, broadcaster, we're saying, hey, we're going to make this impact in this community as a result of you funding this. You're not going to get your money back. You're going to get impact back, though. So that's an innovative approach, and that's been working. And now on the flip side, we've got a very strong commercial business, and that's what, what funds a lot of our impact work. So if we're doing work for, you know, Nathan, all the big boys in, in New Brunswick and Atlanta, Canada, you know, uh, that really helps us keep the lights on so we can do that. So anyway, the, that, that was the challenge. Model's getting old. Nobody believes in our film industry. I believe in it, but... Yeah. So did you create your new model just kind of trial and error? Frustration. Um, also, maybe a little lack of confidence as well because I'm not in Toronto and... My friends who have production companies in Toronto, they get to see their broadcaster, their their customer, anytime they want. Bam, they're straight down the street. For me, it's going to cost 2500 bucks every time I go meet my potential customer. It's not sustainable. Therefore, I don't talk to them as much. And when I do, I'm not, I don't have the relationship built. I don't have the confidence. Yeah. And when I say confidence, I mean like, 
Is yeah. it worth me investing all the way down there if I'm just not part of the mix? So yeah. out of that frustration, and I'm still, we're still getting big size TV shows. Like our last TV series called Real Houses is on Slice and W Network and Oprah's Network. Like that was a $2 million project that we did. That's not a small Canadian project. That's a yep. big project yep. and we got it, uh, which is awesome. Yep. But they're so far and few between when we do them. And the Antiques Roadshow, which your producer uh, that helps you with this show, your editor, did. Um, that was a very large budget project, and that was a New Brunswick success story. Yeah. Very few and far between these things. So that, that's the challenge. Yeah. I guess the other challenge too is really um, tr trying to focus on working in promoting uh, sustainability and you know positive impact in business. Um, a lot of that market is in the U.S. for me. We love our our clients in Atlantic Canada, but there's only so many of them. Yep. So for having such a scale here, it's very difficult. So that's a challenge. To overcome that, I've become very uh, active in public speaking at conferences in the U.S., really active in blogging and podcasting. I need to get my voice and my story and what we can do as storytellers out to the world and still live geographically in New Brunswick. So these are a few challenges and a few solutions that we've been yeah. iterating with. Do you have a, one that you can hang as a, a success story or one that gives you lots of excitement or juice You know, back? I'd say the Millennial Dream was a real fun project that we did it for New Brunswickers. Not for, no, for New Brunswickers first, for Atlantic Canadians second, yeah. for Canadians third, and for Americans fourth, yeah. and the world fifth. When you watch the film, you can, get, you can watch The Millennial Dream on iTunes and on Amazon. So you just do a quick search. Um, when you watch the film, it's very American. Uh, even though we made it for New Brunswickers. Yeah. If, you're, if you watch it and, and you're an American from New York or from Ohio, you will feel it was an American uh, storyteller that, that told it using American statistics, American, American, American. Yeah. And we did that because we wanted to challenge the American dream and say, how is the American dream evolving? And... So we took the American approach. We, we really didn't talk about New Brunswick much, but the themes that came out of it were so relevant to New Brunswick. Mm. We toured that film around, around uh, this province and ch helped change a new, new uh, ch narrative, really, yeah. a new discussion by having all these small focus groups and screenings and discussions. And then we took it across North America and we, we've, uh, to date, um, had five, over 5,000 individuals in small group settings across Canada and the U.S., sit and watch that film and had myself or Jean Viav or Dave Alston or Marcel or Karina lead discussions after. And that's a New Brunswick initiative that's impacting cities as far away as San Francisco and San Diego and New York and Vancouver and Montreal. Like, really cool. So that, I would say that's a, that's a great example of us making local impact with global relevance. And that's what I'm all about. That, that was great. That's a great way to encapsulate the, the whole thing. Um, so what's next? What's, what's coming on your plate? For A ton of stuff is on the plate. A lot of really small, cool projects. One of them is we are just launching into a pilot to start um, uh, an anti-poverty uh, campaign in St. John. Again, looking at some of these best practices, these models that are working mm -hmm. in, an, uh, in our rundown, stinky poor town, you know, saying that to all the Fredertonians who, who, who think that of us. Uh, we're, we're really going to show in documentary format, in small documentary format, some real kick-ass things that are happening in that space. And I'm excited for that project. So we're going we're gonna to release that um, as we build it over the next year and a half. And hopefully, if it works out, it's gonna, as we release content, we're going to continue raising money to make a full-blown a full blown documentary like The Millennial Dream and tour that around because it's so important for us to get our full New Brunswick community on board with poverty in our own backyards. Yeah. Very excited about that particular project. And if anybody wants to stand on top of those things, you're probably going to show this anyway later on, but just finding Hemming's House on Facebook is a good way to do it. My personal email, or sorry, my personal website is greghemmings.me. And when you go on there, you're almost forced to put your email in to join my newsletter. And I'm keeping everybody really up to date with where these cool projects are going Great. on that email list. Um, but if anybody's interested in, in following along or have, have some input, that's yep. a good place to go. Great. Um, thoughts to close us out? I think what you're doing is awesome. You're doing your part. 
in uh, sharing this idea that storytelling is critical in in making this province even more successful than it already is. And uh, um, I think what you should do with all your future guests is encourage them to become ambassadors of storytelling in, in this province too, because you might be talking to a, you know, a mill worker, for example. Well, that person is, belongs to a union and that union's strong and that, that union has power uh, to shift dialogues in their community. I'm just using it as an example. There's all these different types of people that have influence that are on your show that you should, you should make it a challenge, you know? Thank you for being on my show. You're not able to leave that garage door until you commit to being a storyteller, telling uh, ambassador. Yeah. yeah. Dude, can you picture one day um, a gathering of storytellers? I mean, yeah, I think about that stuff all the time. Face yeah, face-to-face -to -face was to great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you, are you talking about face-to-face, -face, the Progress Magazine thing? No. No, I'm okay. Not. Sorry, I'm thinking of uh, a gathering of um, oh, yeah. two, two or three hundred, a thousand storytellers. Oh, yeah. To, to help, you know, like a large-scale event. Like, and sort of like Evolve, but specific to storytelling. I like your thinking. We've, we have, um, this is a little bit of a, a re precursor uh, to something that we're developing uh, more on an international level. But we were thinking about maybe doing our first one in New Brunswick, not sure. But we're working with uh, some partners in San Francisco, San Diego, New York on this project, and Boston on this project. And we're calling it Content Camps. And this is exactly what you're talking about, where we get storytellers. Uh, I won't go into any more details, but we're gonna get storytellers of all sorts, podcasters, bloggers, videographers, filmmakers, writers, whatever artists, musicians, um, getting together to solve really big social problems through story. And uh, that might be a few months down the road, mm -hmm. but if people stay, stay tuned with what I'm doing, we will be releasing that. So the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're kind of tweaking on something there. <laughs> sort of following that theme and maybe on a closing note, um, some of the artists we've had on the show um, are sensitive to social change somewhere before it happens. Yeah. And you're evoking almost the same sort of thing that, and, and it's those people who will guide us through times of major transition or major social change. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like a window for that to happen. Uh, I, I like your thinking. It won't be, it won't be a burning man though, will it? Oh, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to figure out what to burn. But if we can burn all the old attitudes about, uh, you know, the lies that, about how much we suck as a province, if we could burn those in a big tower, that'd be cool. I'll be all over that. I can see that. Everybody <laughs> brings something and, and boom, boom, and it's gone now. There we go. Let her go. It's good. <laughs> Thank you for this. All right. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching. As always, be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.